thank everybody for joining us today for the newest installment of the GB Insight Genetic Medicine webinar series. Today, we're very excited to have Dr. James Underberg give us a presentation titled Hiding in Plain Sight, What Genetic Testing Adds to the Diagnosis and Management of Lip Disorders. Um, Dr. James Underberg is an assistant professor at the NYU School of Medicine, past president of the National Lipid Association. Uh, Dr. Underberg is the medical director of the Lipid Clinic at Bellevue Hospital and is the founder and president of the New York Preventive Cardiovascular Society. Um, so quick little bit of housekeeping. So we'll have a few minutes at the end of Dr. Underberg's presentation for Q&A. If you have any questions, please type it into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Um, we'll try to get everybody's questions, but also being cognizant of Dr. Underberg's time. Uh, another thing, so this webinar is being recorded and a copy of it will, will be available at the GB Insight webinars website within a few days. Um, so without further ado, Dr. James Underberg. All right, Mendel, thanks so much for the kind introduction. And I'm going to share my slides in one second here. I just wanna to get to the beginning. Okay, hold on a second. All right. There we go. Thank you very much. Okay, so trying to come up with a, a fun and relevant title. Um, I came up with this idea, hiding in plain sight. Um, the idea being that while genetic testing can be informative, um, it can also um, lead us in pathways that we might not otherwise have suspected. And I think it allows us in many cases to then translate information to patients that in fact may lead to hopefully um, um, better understanding of their underlying disorders. And, and in some cases perhaps um, improve care, care pathways. So, so um, this is me. You can also find me on Twitter at lipid doc. Um, and I'm always happy to interact about lipids and opine on other interesting things. Um, my disclosure information is listed here for you. And, and this is the outline. I'm really trying to keep it simple. Genetic testing in lipid disorders, why, when, whom, and how. And, and what I've done is I've interspersed a couple of cases throughout the first part of the talk. And then at the end, I have several cases that I thought were just examples from patients that I've seen. Uh, change details about the cases, um, but um, ideally trying to just give you a better idea of, of how to think about this. So here's a case to start off with. I always think it's good to start off a, a, a talk with the case. Patient is a 22-year-old woman with a strong family history of premature heart disease. So Bell should go off immediately. Her father had an MI at age 51. She's a non-smoker. Paternal grandfather, sudden death at age 48. Um, Mother had normal cholesterol, maternal grandparents, normal cholesterol and no premature ASCVD. So it seems that the family history is through the paternal line. Her older brother has high cholesterol, but he doesn't take any lipid lowering medications. And on exam, she has bilateral inferior corneal arcus at age 22 and a left irregular Achilles tendon. And we look at her lipid panel, her total cholesterol is 310 and her LDL is 231 milligrams per deciliter her HDL is 58 and her triglycerides are 105. And so these are some questions to consider about genetic testing in the context of this patient. And so I ask you, would genetic testing help with risk assessment in this patient? Is genetic testing required for the diagnosis? Will genetic testing determine choice of medical therapy? And will genetic testing help with dietary recommendations and lifestyle recommendations? And were we in a live audience, I would be interested in going back and forth with people on this. But I think there are some interesting things about this that would help us answer those questions. So at least clinically, one would suspect that she has familial hypercholesterolemia, an inherited autosomal dominant disorder, usually due to mutations in the LDL receptor mute gene, or and other genes such as ApoB and PCSK9 that impact the functionality of the LDL receptor. Clinical manifestations, severely elevated cholesterol due to accumulation of plasma LDL, um, accompanied by, by deposition of cholesterol in the tendon and skin, uh, 
causing xanthoma, corneal arcus in the eye, and early evidence of cardiovascular disease. These are examples of the corneal arcus, the tendon xanthomas. Up here, you see xanthelasma. You can see xanthelasma with normal cholesterol. These are reactive giant cells. Do not let anyone have these removed by a plastic surgeon. Um, if you see it before the age of 25 in someone with high cholesterol, it can be helpful in making the diagnosis. And so some useful information around genetic testing. This comes from a scientific statement that I was a co-author on, published um, in the Journal of Clinical Lipidology. It's a free download, and you can see the reference here at the bottom. You can get it at lipid.org. Um, but just to remind us, mutations um, in a gene on one of the first 22 non-sex chromosome cause what we call autosomal disorders. Autosomal dominant requires only one copy of the abnormal gene to manifest the phenotype. Um, the abnormal gene dominates the pair of genes, so a child has a 50% chance of inheriting the disorder, even if only one parent has the dominant gene. Autosomal recessive means the two copies of the abnormal gene must be present to cause the disorder. People with only one defective gene are, gene are carriers and they do not manifest the phenotype. And so here a child has a 25% of chance of inheriting the disorder if both parents, both parents have to be carriers or carry the autosomal recessive mutation. And so causes of FH, there are several, the majority of these are defects in the LDL receptor. And I'll show you why in a second. But we can have abnormalities in the ApoB gene, TCSK9 gain of function mutations. And there's also another uh, protein involved in a process called IDL, which is a non PCSK9 way of metabolizing the LDL receptor, breaking it down. And then finally, there is an autosomal recessive cause of FH due to an abnormality in the LDL adapter protein, which is very uncommon. Over 1,700 mutations have been identified in the LDL receptor gene. And the question is why? Most monogenic disorders, if we're lucky, have one or two causes. Why so many causes of FH via abnormalities in the LDL receptor gene? Well, I, I think it has to do with the fact, and that's why I, I presented the slide this way, the kind of complex architecture of the LDL receptor protein. It, it's kind of a scaffolded protein, and it's held together with all of these disulfide bonds. And if anything disrupts that structure, the whole thing kind of comes falling down, almost like a Jenga game. And so that's my way of reminding myself about why most of these mutations are in the LDL receptor. It's a wonderful paper published in Jack in 2018. Amy Sturm was the lead author there. She's a, a genetic counselor. And um, um, they go through algorithms on genetic testing for FH. They remind us that, that the phenotypes can overlap the genotypes, and that's very important to remember. You know, common hypercholesterolemia can actually overlap with patients who have heterozygous FH, and heterozygous FH phenotypes can actually overlap with patients who have homozygous FH at the high and low end of the scale of these disorders. And so the more you understand about the diagnosis, I think the more it enables you to determine risk and potential therapeutic options. And we'll talk about that in a bit. So why risk? Well, well, again, LDL burden over the course of the lifetime, the temporal relationship of a risk factor over the course of the lifetime is often what determines how impactful it will be on the end risk or lack of risk if you remove that risk factor over time. So patients without FH down here at the bottom, you can see, Somewhere between the fifth and sixth decade of life is where they start developing atherosclerosis. Um, patients who have homozygous FH, the most severe form of this condition, can develop atherosclerosis by the end of the first decade of life, and certainly into their, their, their 20s, um, so the second decade of life. Um, if we impact elevated cholesterol levels in patients with heterozygous FH early on, we can actually shift the curve. Hence, we can actually decrease their lifetime exposure to cholesterol and um, actually, to some extent, approximate the disease course and trajectory of those with elevated cholesterol without FH. And the later you intervene, the more intensely that intervention has to be to achieve the same effect over the course of the lifetime. 
So we talked about risk and I showed you some graphics already about the differences between homozygous and heterozygous FH in the early progression of atherosclerosis. Generally, we think in patients with heterozygous FH, it's a 20 times greater risk over the course of the lifetime of developing ASCVD. This is an analysis looking at all comers of patients with elevated LDL cholesterol levels done by a group up at Harvard a couple of years ago. And, and what they were able to do is they were able to genotype patients um, and then match that to their LDL cholesterol level. And you can see in blue that in patients who get to LDL levels below 190 and certainly greater than 220, there's a doubling to tripling of risk. But the patients in red represent those who have a monogenic mutation that has been identified consistent with familial hypercholesterolemia. And you can see that, that the risk goes from five to 17 fold and from seven and a half to almost 26 fold, my apologies. And so the presence of a monogenic mutation in itself identifies patients that are at greater risk for, in this case, odds ratio for coronary artery disease. Um, now, do I think it's the mutation itself or do I think the mutation is simply identifying folks who truly have had high cholesterol from day one in their lifetime? Um, but it certainly, I think, is informative. Um, and you can see that even when you adjust for LDL, which is interesting, uh, that risk is still greater in the patients greater than 190 with an FH mutation. And the odds ratio is 1.6 versus 4.2. Um, and so when we think about testing patients with um, FH, again, we look for patients at risk due to a family history or patients with an FH phenotype. And, and you can find patients with positive results. And um, if they have positive genetic testing results, but the phenotype is negative, meaning their cholesterol is normal, you're gonna monitor them. And that's assuming they were tested because of a family history and known mutation. If you have patients who already have the phenotype, and the genotype is positive, you're gonna treat the LDL. If the genotype is negative, you at least wanna take a step back and think about some other alternative molecular etiologies. Could it be polygenic hypercholesterolemia? And we'll talk about that. Elevated lipoprotein little a, yet undiscovered FH genes. And then there are phenocopies, things that look like FH that are other, have other monogenic causes such as cytosterolemia or lysosomal acid lipase deficiency. As I mentioned, there was an NLA statement on genetic testing in dyslipidemia, um, like the FH paper in Jack. this is a free download. And I would also recommend taking a look at this. Um, we review genetic testing in FH and very much endorse the recommendations of the Jack paper. So I'm not gonna go into this in detail, but it should be offered to individuals at any age in which a strong clinical suspicion for FH exists on the basis of either examination of the patient's clinical or family history. Um, genetic testing may be considered in children with LDL levels greater than 160, adults with no treatment treatment LDL levels, but with a personal history, a premature CAD and a family history of both high cholesterol and premature CAD or adults with persistent LDL levels greater than 160 in the setting of a family history of high cholesterol and either a personal history or a family history of premature CAD. So, so what are some of the interesting things to know about benefits here? Well, obviously genetic testing increases diagnosis rates, right? Well, you would think that, but it's great to know that we have clinical data that supports that. And so this is a prospective registry looking at patients who have a variety of different clinical criteria, a cried, to the diagnosis of FH, Dutch Lipid Clinic Network, Simon Broom and MedPed. Genetic testing was done, looking at the four most common genes um, that can cause FH, the LDL receptor, PCSK9, APOV, and the adapter protein. The bottom line was incorporating genetic testing diagnosed almost 50% more patients with definite FH in comparison to classification solely on clinical grounds. So we can approve not only um, potentially risk assessment, but diagnosis rates. Um, interestingly enough, when we look at monogenic versus polygenic hypercholesterolemia, monogenic FH, and risk of ASCVD, it turns out that when you look at individuals with comparable levels of LDL cholesterol, both monogenic and polygenic, 
with monogenic being a greater risk than those with monogenic, polygenic FH, were significantly associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular events compared to those who did not have an identified genetic cause. And if we think about genomic risk prediction in patients with coronary artery disease, there's tons of papers about this now, reminding us that genomic risk scores for coronary disease and genomic risk scores for high cholesterol both predict cardiovascular event rates. In fact, it's really fascinating to know that at any given risk factor that you evaluate a patient with, let's say an LDL receptor abnormality or patients with LPA, or whether they have heterozygous or homozygous FH, if you do polygenic risk scores here for atherogenic lipoproteins, meaning cholesterol risk scores, or you do risk scores for a risk for coronary disease, they can either up or down risk the patient at any level along this continuum. Very much the way we think of it as an example, coronary calcium score. So this is just another tool I think available to us from the genetic perspective to think about this. Now, some things to know about polygenic risk scores, they've expanded to include millions of variants. There are advances in statistical methods to develop to kind of analyze these patients. I think as increased emphasis on clinical studies demonstrating the benefit of incorporating this into routine care will kind of catalyze their use. Uh, currently, they're not standardized and the reference populations vary. So, so while I don't think this is something that should be done on everyone as part of their clinical care, the information is interesting. And if it's made available to you, you should at least be aware of some of the data around it. This was a very recent paper that was just published on clinical implementation of combined monogenic and polygenic risk disclosure for coronary disease, both to patients and their providers. Um, and that what they did is they looked at patients um, who um, either had high polygenic risk scores and no FH variants, high polygenic risk scores and an FH variant, or low polygenic risk score and no FH variant. I apologize, every time I move my pointer, I accidentally move the slides, I'm sorry. And you can see here along this continuum, if we look at increasing polygenic score percentile and increasing genomic risk for coronary disease, the patients with no FH variants have an increase in risk based on their polygenic risk score, and the patients with FH variants do also, but they're at a much higher level. And so by doing this, it's interesting 40% of patients had a change in the clinical management after disclosure. And that was either statin initiation, statin intensification, or having coronary imaging. Those were the three metrics that were evaluated. So there does seem to be some impact there. So I think going back to our first case, um, when we think about what some of the answers might be, I think it can aid in diagnosis. It can aid in risk assessment. And it can certainly aid in guiding therapeutic interventions and choice of medications. If you know a patient has FH, it's easier to get certain medications approved for them, such as PCSK9 inhibitors. Um, and it will certainly inform you with regards to screening other family members and doing cascade genetic testing on them. Um, finally, if you know a patient has FH, then you're more inclined to be very aggressive about a diet restricted in saturated fat and restricted in dietary cholesterol intake, um, because we know these patients respond better than the overall population to that particular dietary intervention. So here's the second case of a 15-year-old male, no medical issues, seen in the emergency room Saturday night with severe abdominal pain after a high-fat meal and alcohol. Labs showed a triglyceride over 4,000, total cholesterol 250, unable to measure HDL and LDL, severe abdominal pain with diffused tenderness. Radiologic and lab evaluation was consistent with acute pancreatitis, was treated with um, um, being NPO, IV hydration, plasmapheresis, discharged on phenofibrate and a low-fat diet. And so again, I, I throw some questions for pondering um, about genetic testing in this patient. And this was actually part of an audience response, but I'll just go through it. Which of the following is correct? based on the case presented. The cause of his pancreatitis was the alcohol and fat intake. No need for pharmacologic intervention if he could avoid this combination going forward. And remember, he had a high fat meal and alcohol. 
um, that night. Um, genetic testing can help to understand his risk going forward, recurrent episodes of pancreatitis. C, genetic testing is required as pharmacologic treatments targeting this condition require proof of monogenic cause for approval. And D, genetic testing can help guide dietary treatment for this condition. And so at least based on his clinical presentation, one would guess that he had um, a genetic cause of high triglycerides known as familial chylomicronemia syndrome. And this can be caused just like FH by several different genetic mutations, the most common being in the lipoprotein lipase gene. Um, and so almost all of these cases, 95% are in the LPL gene. But gen, just like we have in FH, there are other less common mutations that affect the functionality of lipoprotein lipase to remove triglycerides from chylomicrons, um, such as APOC2, GPI-HPP1, APOA5, and lipase maturation factor one. I have seen one case of lipo lipase maturation factor one in my entire practice history. These are not common conditions, and even lipoprotein lipase um, abnormalities are, are not common. Um, it's rare. Um, triglycerides typically over 1,000 due to elevated chylomicrons. Um, you can also see this caused by, as I mentioned, by APOC2 deficiency, which is an activator of lipoprotein lipase. Generally, it presents an infancy as soon as uh, children start feeding, um, treated with total fat restriction. But it can present later in life, typically in the teenage years, um, when someone gets exposed to secondary stressors of triglyceride production, such as alcohol or a high fat meal or both, or sometimes the use of um, oral contraceptives um, in the teenage years. Um, and that in the setting of a high fat meal or alcohol can sometimes increase triglycerides and manifest the condition for the first time. Um, hemorrhagic pancreatitis is life-threatening, which is why we generally don't give these patients heparin um, as a management um, tool for high triglycerides. Typically, they have lactose in serum when you centrifuge it, and you can see the eruptive xanthoma. Many times, these patients will present to a dermatologist. Again, the majority of these mutations are lipoprotein lipase, um, but you can see a large chunk of these patients have no mutations identified at all. Um, so what do we know about genetic testing for FCS? It can help establish the diagnosis. The diagnosis can be made clinically. However, like the concept of familial hypercholesterolemia and polygenic hypercholesterolemia, there's FCS and then there's a multifactorial chylomicronemia syndrome or, or MCS, which is a multi-causal um, and often polygenic cause. Um, there are no specific therapeutic pharmacologic ava options available for FCS in the US. In Europe, there are. We have drugs approved for triglyceride lowering, such as um, fibrates and high-dose omega-3s, but they typically don't work well in true chylomicronemia syndromes because they work via upregulation of lipoprotein lipase. Um, what's key in these patients is dietary treatment. And I've highlighted in red the word treatment because it's not dietary recommendations or guidance. The diet is the intervention, it's the treatment. These patients must be on severe fat restricted diets, less than 10% or even lower of total body fat, total calories from fat. Uh, most of these patients have to prepare their meals at home. If they go out or eat outside of the home, they can't necessarily trust that it's been prepared properly. And, even very small amounts of fat can trigger an episode of acute pancreatitis. But it may be required as a diagnosis genetic testing if targeted therapies become available down the road. Um, and again, in the FH paper, um, we make some recommendations regarding the utility of genetic testing for dyslipidemias and a resource on key aspects. Um, we review the differences again between monogenic and polygenic dyslipidemias. And we certainly make point that these monogenic disorders, including FH, FCS, familial dysbeta lipoproteinemia, LCAT deficiency, A beta lipoproteinemia, et cetera, are areas where there clearly is uh, benefit in looking at um, these patients with regards to genetic causality. This is just a guidance on some of the indications for genetic testing. I said some, 
because I think it's expanding at a rapid rate. Uh, this already is more than a year and a half old and the FH paper is several years old now. But just the strong clinical suspicion of a genetic dyslipidemia in my mind is enough, all right? Strong family history, prevalence of related syndromic features, evidence that testing might change management, available of effective early interventions, a, a, a eligibility for newer investigational drugs. There may not be something available yet, but it doesn't mean you couldn't put the patient in a clinical trial. I can't tell you how many times I've heard someone say, well, my clinician would not order a lipoprotein A level because they told me there's no way to treat it. Well, we have a bunch of clinical trials going on right now for interventions for elevated lipoprotein A. There's no way you could even be in a trial if you didn't know it was elevated. And then patient preference. Some patients just want to know and family preference. So again, we give you some additional guidance on this. Um, we just give you a, an oversight of some of the key, um, what we call selected monogenic dyslipidemias that I think any lipidologist should know about. FH is on the top, chylomicronemia, cystosterolemia, CTX, LALD or Wolman's disease, lysosomal acid lipase deficiency, and A-beta lipoproteinemia. Um, I think informed consent is key and either work with a genetic counselor or learn how to do this yourself. Um, NYU has a great um, several hour CME course given by our genetic group on genetic counseling for the internist. I took it. I feel very comfortable now doing the counseling. They gave me some great advice, um, but um, many of the companies that order or do genetic testing will provide genetic counselors for your patients if results are abnormal, so that um, even if you don't have access to genetic counseling at your own institution, um, that should not be a barrier for you ordering the testing. You just need to make sure that you make genetic testing, gen genetic counseling available um, when doing this. Some interesting recommendations, do's and don'ts. I'm just highlighting three here. Before ordering a genetic test, it's recommended to obtain informed consent and counsel the patient about the benefits and risk. Cascade screening for FH is key and important. Once you find an abnormality, you wanna offer testing to all first degree family members. And then a no, right? A lot of times we hear about yeses, but a no, we do not recommend direct to consumer genetic tests. Um, they're not appropriate for um, clinical use in the dyslipidemia space. So I, I will now end with three additional cases that we will have some time for discussion. Um, again, we call this hiding in plain sight. So um, I'm just gonna show you some cases and maybe discuss a little bit about the thought processes of these and um, then we'll open up the floor for discussion. So our first patient is a 56 year old woman referred for a history of low HDL cholesterol. No prior history of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Total cholesterol is 191, triglycerides 132. Her HDL is four. And as far as she remembers, the highest it's ever been is nine. And her LDL is 162. Her APOB is elevated at 139 milligrams per deciliter, which is actually even higher than the LDL would probably predict. Um, so she definitely does have an increased amount of atherogenic APOB containing lipoproteins. And she has a coronary calcium score done after presenting with these lipid values um, that showed a score of 93, which places her in the 94th percentile based on her age and sex. So the first question I would ask is, does the low HDL level represent an increased ASCVD risk? Lipidologists love talking about low HDL cholesterol syndromes. I've given lectures about this time and time again, and I've always said, unless it's less than 10, it's probably not one of those syndromes. And here was a patient staring at me with an HDL that's never been greater than 10. So certainly I was thinking about inherited HDL disorders. And in many cases, they do represent increased risk. Um, the, um, the disorders of underproduction of, of, of HDL cholesterol uh, 
Certainly, some of them can be associated with increased risk of cardiovascular disease, hypoalpha lipoproteinemia, as an example. Um, but the second question that I always try to answer as an internist and a lipidologist is, is there a disorder that will explain all of the lipid findings? Is there a way that you could link together Occam's razor, right, the low HDL and the high LDL? And I will be honest, I thought about this for a long time. I reached out to everyone I could think of who I thought was more um, informed than I was or might see more patients about this than I could. And I could not find nor think of a disorder that would explain this with one unifying diagnosis. And so the question of how to treat this patient, at least to me, was a little unclear without some additional information. And so we did genetic testing on this patient. And the patient turns out to be a compound heterozygote for the ABCA1 mutation consistent with Tangier's disease. So this was my first case of Tangier's disease in practice. And for those of you who, who know and understand these genetic conditions, Tangier's disease, we used to think was associated with increased risk of ASCVD, but it turns out that if the only mutation in HDL um, physiology is the ABCA1 gene, it turns out that can cholesterol can still leave the macrophage and end up on more mature HDL cholesterol particles via alternative exit strategies from the macrophage. And so probably Tangier's disease on his own would not explain this. Um, but interestingly enough, the patient also had a variant of undetermined significance in the LDL receptor gene. And I suspect that this may actually be clinically relevant in this patient and the cause of her LDL cholesterol and ApoB elevation. And so does the low LDL HDL cholesterol represent increased risk? Probably not. Is there a disorder that will explain all the lipid findings? It's not that I can think of. And how would you treat this patient? We treated the elevated LDL and ApoB with statins and azetamide to start. Um, so I think this is an example of you know, an interesting and complex patient something that clearly would be in the realm of a lipidologist. But I think without the genetic testing, it would have been rather difficult for me to sort out the appropriate um, diagnostic and management strategies. Never mind that we immediately asked her to, to screen all of her first degree family members um, for the genetic abnormalities that we had discovered. So our next case, again, hiding in plain sight, um, last time we had the fake nose and mustache, now we have the, the eye covered, um, is a 51-year-old woman with a family history of premature ASCVD, has known of high cholesterol in the past, but has never taken lipid-lowering therapy until recently, and had been told of no need to treat because in the past her HDL cholesterol had been elevated, and we've all seen this in the past, seen by a cardiologist sent for a coronary artery calcium score, which was zero but did have carotid dopplers done showing a focal heterogeneous plaque at the right side at the perfect bifurcation of the common carotid artery. Based on exam and family history and her lipid values, her Dutch Lipid Clinic Network score was 10, which is consistent with definite familial hypercholesterolemia. And her labs prior to any treatment showed an LDL cholesterol of 212, her HDL was 51, her triglycerides were actually elevated at 191, and her total cholesterol was 300. In addition, her lipoprotein A was 234 nanomoles per liter, so it was elevated. Now, in her chart, there was a notation of a left Achilles xanthoma, but on my exam, I could not appreciate the xanthoma. Um, there were no irregularities. I thought her Achilles were normal thickening. She had been started on both high-intensity statin and azetamide, not inappropriate, I think, given the clinical scenario. And her LDL cholesterol, um, when we saw her, was 53. Her HDL was 57. Her triglycerides were 104. And her total cholesterol was 129. Her lipoprotein A was really no different. It was 269 nanomoles per liter. And her ApoB um, was 67 milligrams per deciliter. And so we did genetic testing on this patient. One of the things that had come up prior with her being referred to us was that it had been suggested that she start a PCSK9 inhibitor. 
based on the diagnosis of FH, the plaque, um, and the elevated lipoprotein A level. The patient was hesitant to take any additional lipid-lowering medication. Um, and I think that when you see and talk with patients, we often have in our mind how aggressive we want to be and why we want to be aggressive. But it's important to remember that patients have a perspective also, and it's a lifelong process in treating patients with inherited lipid disorders. And it's a team-based approach and they have to be on board with everything you recommend. And if they don't, it's gonna be very difficult, I think, to manage them long-term. And so it's always important to take into account patient preference. So we did genetic testing on her and she did not have any pathogenic and likely pathogenic variants for familial hypercholesterolemia, which I'm gonna be honest, surprised me. I would have bet dollars to donuts prior to this that she would. And it just reminds me, the more testing I do, the more I find things I didn't expect. Um, and that's one of the things that you will start to realize the more genetic testing you do. Um, with regards to variants of uncertain significance and high-risk variants, she did have a mutation um, in the um, genome for high lipoprotein A associated with short um, Kringle type four, two repeats. Um, which is typically associated with high LPA levels. Um, and we know that high LPA levels are associated with increased risk of cardiovascular disease. And she also had polygenic risk scoring. And her polygenic risk scoring, um, when we looked at her relative risk based on her referent population, showed that for combined hyperlipidemia, she was almost in the 75th percentile. And remember, her triglycerides were elevated prior to treatment also. And for hypercholesterolemia, she was in the 73rd percentile, moderately high risk versus the reference population. And so in this patient, um, again, we talked to her about the high risk associated with her lipoprotein A. Um, we suggested to her that the cause of her elevated LDL was most likely a polygenic hypercholesterolemia and not familial hypercholesterolemia. So probably slightly lower risk than someone with a monogenic cause. She has a zero coronary calcium score, which would not obviate treatment in someone with FH. And someone without FH, I'm not quite sure how to evaluate that, especially in the setting of a carotid plaque. And so um, we, as a team, decided to um, hold off on a PCSK9 inhibitor for now. Probably would have been very difficult to get it approved based on the um, genetic testing and her um, LDL level that was already below 70. Um, but I didn't think it was an unreasonable course of action given her preference to not take another medication at this point. Um, and then our third case is a 36 year old male with a history of high cholesterol, first aware of this in his late teenage years, recalls the total cholesterol level being above 500 in the past but he's been treated with statins and azetamide on and off, never the whole time, for at least 15 years now. And he had been referred to us after actually having a PCSK9 inhibitor added. It's always interesting to me when you ask patients to recall lipid panels from years past, they always seem to be able to remember their total cholesterol, but they can't remember what the LDL cholesterol was. I don't quite know why, but that seems to be the case. And you can see that now on a high intensity statin, um, excuse me. Here we go. Now on a high intensity statin, ezetimibe and a PCSK9 inhibitor, his LDL cholesterol is 115 milligrams per deciliter. His HDL is 52, his triglycerides are 53 and the total cholesterol is 177. Now, even though his, his total cholesterol was above 500 in the past, that dramatic of a reduction in LDL cholesterol, when someone who's given three drugs that work via upregulating the LDL receptor, at least on my mind said to me that this is probably heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia and not homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. Although that total cholesterol greater than 500 kept bugging me, it didn't make sense. These patients don't typically have total cholesterol levels that high. He did have bilateral thickened and irregular Achilles tendons and inferior corneal arcus. 
on both thighs. Couldn't give me any information about xanthoma when he was young. So the question is, what's the diagnosis and what would you do next? His, his LDL is 115 on statin, azetamide, PCSK9 inhibitor. Um, and so again, genetic testing informs us. He had genetic testing done and turned out to have homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. In fact, what we often describe as simple HOFH, the identical LDL receptor mutation in each allele. Um, so this is a patient with HOFH that immediately vaults him to a very high risk status. And on further investigation, we were actually able to find those old labs. And you can see his LDL was greater than 500 off treatment. Total cholesterol was 536. And so this is someone who, despite having clear response to LDL-lowering therapies via the LDL receptor, having LDL receptor activity, this patient has HOFH genetically. And so we actually started the patient on evanacumab and were able to get it approved based on the genetic testing. And on evanacumab, the LDL cholesterol is now less than 34. The HDL is 33, the triglycerides are 35, total cholesterol 76. The patient did have CTA done, um, CT angiography, and had extensive three vessel coronary disease. Um, stress testing was normal. Um, ultimately went to cardiac cath and there were no lesions that were obstructive that required intervention luckily, um, but it was diffuse disease throughout the coronary tree. Um, and so I think very aggressive lowering in this patient and utilization of, in this case, a drug like even Acumab um, allowed us to um, further intensify his regimen. So we're coming up on about 40 minutes. In summary, genetic testing can provide important clinical information for patients and their relatives. There are multiple factors to consider when selecting a genetic test, and it's important patients provide informed consent prior to testing. And so I'll end with three views of Bellevue where I spend part of my time and have quite a fond uh, memory of my training there. I have an antique postcard collection of Bellevue and this is three of them that I'm always happy to share with people. And so at this point, um, I think we'll open the floor up to questions, okay? I'm gonna stop okay. sharing. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Underwood, for the insightful presentation. So yeah, just real quickly, if you do have a question, just type it into the Q&A. Um, okay, so let's see, from a uh, couple of questions here from Dr. Twardarski. Uh, if you have a 63-year-old male who has a total cholesterol in the about 250 and the LDL about 160 to 170, HDL about 40, BMI about 30. Physically active, runs four miles, uh, no family history. Do you, uh, any testing or benefits? Well, it's important to remember that an LDL cholesterol greater than 160, even in the guidelines, is a very significant risk factor for coronary disease. And the reason for that is that you know, while we think of 190 as the cutoff for FH, there are many patients with inherited disorders of LDL metabolism, including monogenic FH mutations with LDL levels less than 190. And in as much as you can inherit a defective gene from a parent, you can also inherit a protective gene from a parent. And so you may not manifest the exact same phenotype as a parent, but you still may carry the genotype. Um, and so in someone with an LDL cholesterol of 160, um, I certainly think that there would be benefit from doing genetic testing in a patient like that. And I think it might inform you either with regards to polygenic risk um, or potentially um, a variety of mutations that you might otherwise not expect. Um, understanding that you may find nothing too. And it's always important to let a patient know going into genetic testing that there's a good chance you won't find anything. And I, I try to tell people that just because we don't find a mutation doesn't mean that the cause of their high cholesterol isn't, quote, on an inherited basis. So that's a long answer to a short question. Um, and then from Dr. Stein, assuming he's referring to the patient with Tangier's disease, does the person have orange tonsils? So interestingly enough, the person did not have oral tonsils. I brought her back twice to look at them under mm -hmm. as heavy light as I can find. 
she did not have oral uh, orange tonsils. So I was a little disappointed. I was hoping to find it and I did not. Um, um, okay, another question from Dr. Stein says, great presentation. What are your thoughts on the on LPA from the recent European Ethics Society consensus statement last month in which LP little a value identified a specific age would result in a certain LDLC reduction goal to reduce ACVD risk? Yeah, I, I, I certainly think the Europeans are always a step ahead of us. And um, I think aggressive risk factor management in general in patients with elevated LPA is about the best course of action we have right now. Um, and so from my perspective, I don't think those recommendations are unreasonable. I just think that, that translating them to the US with regards to testing and coverage, you just have to be cautious. But um, uh, you know, here in the United States, the NLA had guidance on LPA testing, did not recommend universal screening. Um, I, I think probably because you know, there were no drugs available to treat LPA, although we do have apheresis as an option. Um, but, but I don't um, have any issues with the European recommendations. Remember, even their LDL guidance preceded ours um, with LDLs below 55 and extremely high-risk patients. And now the ACC expert decision pathway is recommending the same. Um, Follow-up to the LPA theme of Dr. Ost. Pronouncing that properly says, can you discuss your workup of LP level A? Sure. Um, so I think the most important part of an LP little A evaluation is family history. Um, and if you can get a good family history, and there is a significant history of, in particular, premature ASCVD, I think it, it immediately, in my mind, makes LPA a more significant finding. Remember that 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 LPA is elevated in 20% of the population. And there are many people who have high LPA who never have an ASCVD event. So trying to leverage information around risk, I think is useful. But I do think we've got other tools available to us now to better assess how we think about managing LPA with regards to risk. Um, and that is both using C-reactive protein, HSCRP, and using coronary artery calcium scoring. Uh, Mike Blaha does a wonderful presentation where he goes through the, the interactions between CAC and LPA, and it clearly at any level. Um, in patients with elevated LPA, if the CAC is abnormal, it intensifies risk. Um, same with um, C-reactive protein. There are two publications now looking at that, one by uh, Michael Shapiro and the other by Bob Rosenson, suggesting that. Um, People often ask me about aspirin and lipoprotein A, and there are two studies suggesting that one particular um, variant in LPA may potentially identify patients who are more likely to benefit from aspirin. Um, but again, those are more observational in nature. They're not randomized controlled outcome studies. So I always caution people on, on thinking about that. If you have elevated LPA and existing subclinical atherosclerosis that is um, of a significant feature, um, certainly that's something to consider. Um, so all of those go into my evaluation of LPA and risk. And then the treatment part of the algorithm is um, aggressive risk factor modification, as we've discussed, or potentially enrolling them in an LPA lowering trial right now. In patients with recurrent cardiac events with elevated LPA, those are the patients that we refer for apheresis. Okay, I'm gonna, this is going to be your last one, uh, Dr. Underberg. It says, thoughts on testing on a six-year-old with an LDL of 130 to 145 and mother in her late 30s with a calcium score of 193 on four medications for total cholesterol equals 300 and testing showing FH in the ApoB and LDL receptor. So if I understand that correctly, the mother has genetically confirmed familial hypercholesterolemia, correct? That's what it's saying. But, um... Right, so, so if the mother has genetically confirmed FH, then the child should be screened for high cholesterol as early as age two. Um, as far as genetic testing, it's easy to do. Um, and if the cholesterol is elevated, you can do genetic testing, although the FH, 
um, guidance would suggest just go right ahead and do the genetic testing. I'm not a pediatrician. I don't take care of kids. Um, so I have to certainly qualify any of my responses here. But at some point, the child should have genetic testing done. Okay, and I'm gonna, just going to answer real quickly. Um, David Schwinn asks if GB uh, Insight offers genetic testing for LP little a and for the Kringle repeats. And I was just going to say that, yes, it's included in our comprehensive test. Um, the caveat being that we do a genomic analysis of the Kringle repeats, and so that's essentially an average of the two alleles, whereas the gold standard, um, being electrophoresis, looks at uh, each individual alleles separately. Um, but uh, in, a, in a large proportion of uh, people, um, people do have short isoforms, but don't necessarily have a concomitant um, SNP that's uh, associated with high LP little So we do a best guess approach. Um, so yeah, that's that's that. Uh, Dr. Arnberg, I really appreciate your time. And um, thank you, everybody else, uh, for, for joining us. And uh, thanks for letting me ramble on about stuff I like to talk about. No, any anytime. And uh, right. appreciate it all. Have okay. a good evening, everyone. Take care. You too.